So for the most of the time, we, was we work with Magento 1, but there are some clients who already want Magento 2. So that's why I'm here. I just wanted to share some experience with you that I recently had. But before that, what I wanted to show you is this. So what you see on these screens, <laughs> <laughs> what you see on these screens is, the, is my original talk title, and that is how to change logo in Magento 2 in less than two hours. Because in the very first couple of days of working with the platform, I felt exactly like this, uh, this guy here. So I was so frustrated and I was lost and confused. So, you know, but it's really okay because as we heard today, Magento 2 uses modern tech stack. It's completely replaced, right? Um, it has a new architecture and all of it looks scary the first couple of days working with it. But in reality, um, once you get over that initial hurdle of figuring out how Magento 2 works on the architectural level, it starts to make a lot of sense. So, um, I think you cannot see the whole slide, but just to give you a better idea, to give you a bigger picture, when we are talking about upgrading to Magento 2, we can split it into two separate pieces. One is database migration, and the other is code base migration. So for the database migration, we basically need to update the structure, which are like tables and relations between them. And we also need to upgrade data, which are rec records in those tables. And the great news about this is that Magento, Magento has published the official tool, which is called Database Migration Tool, which helps you drastically with this process. I can't tell you more about it because these days I'm investigating it, but you know, it, it looks promising so far. And when it comes to the code base, you know, it's a little bit more complex because there are multiple, uh, there are multiple things that need to be upgraded. And all of these need to be treated in a different way. So we have Magento Framework, we have third-party extensions, we have custom modules that are built in-house, and we have custom themes. And I'm really happy that we have just heard more about theming in Magento 2, so we will not focus on that part. Sorry. So there was another slide here. So what we will focus on today is custom modules, this square. Because for <laughs> Magento Framework, well, there is no really effort to upgrade Magento Framework. You simply replace all framework files or core modules, and that's about it. For the third-party extensions, <laughs> ideally, you would like to let your vendors do it for you. Or if that's not possible for some reason, it will basically fall down to you, so it can be considered as upgrading a custom module. So. The next question that you may ask yourself is, what's in the scope for upgrading a custom module? So how do we actually start working on it? This looks much better <laughs> on my laptop, but okay. So these are some of the main steps that you will need to, to work on. The first one, you will definitely start with creating new directory structure. You will also need to to convert configuration XML files to match new Magento 2 format. You will also need to, to convert layout XML files that also need to match Magento 2 format. And finally, the biggest part is converting PHP code. So if you have enough time, or if you simply do it as your side project, I definitely recommend doing all of these steps manually because that one will give you the best possible learning experience. However, that's not something that you would like to do on daily basis because you, you will find yourself repeating the same tasks over and over for every extension that you work on. So you will definitely want to find some way to automate this. And thankfully, Magento has published the official tool for this, which is available on GitHub. It's called Code Migration Tool. 
and it's a great starting point for converting your extensions. So once you, <laughs> once you download the tool, you will need to make some, some preparations in order for this tool to run. It basically, what it does is it accepts Magento 1 code as an input, it does its magic, and then it produces the code that should be compatible with Magento 2. So, um, in order for this tool to work, you will need to create four different folders. One is source folder, where you basically, where you basically put Magento 1 extension that needs to be converted. You also have destination folder. This is the folder where the tool is going to produce the output. And you also need to provide two more folders. One is Magento 1 and the other is Magento 2. So these instances need to be vanilla and they don't need to be installed actually. They're, the, they're just here to provide a little bit more context for the tool. And in Magento 1 folder, you need to put the, the exact same code that you put in source folder. So that's how the tool works. And once you prepare everything for these steps, because th this tool is a command line tool, you will have four different commands available for you. And the first one that you will need to start working on is basically you just run the, the command that will migrate the directory structure. You also have available the command that will migrate layout, the third one is the command that uh, upgrade configuration files. And finally, the last step would be to upgrade your PHP code. But you may be asking yourself now, well, if this tool is available, I don't really need to learn Magento, right? Well, no. It's not going to happen. It, it would be too true, too, too good to be true. So you'll definitely need to learn Magento 2. You need to have Magento 2 skills. As we said, this, this tool is just here to help developers with repetitive tasks, but you need the knowledge. So, now let's see some of the most important changes in Magento 2 for Magento 2 extension developers. We'll start with module directory structure. Because we don't have the concept of code pool, we need to put our module directly under app code. The naming convention is still the same. We use vendor name and then module name. And as you can see, in one module, we basically have similar folder structure. So we still have something like block classes, controller classes, helper models, and stuff like that. Even things like admin grids and custom admin forms these things can be still done in the same way as we do in Magento 1. I mean, the code, the PHP code inside is different, and there is a new XML file structure, but essentially the code, the, the folder structure has not changed a lot. <coughs> what is actually, what has changed is, as we heard in the previous topic, is um, that all stuff that are related, for example, to front-end, like layouts, templates, scripts, CSS stuff, and so on, now go into the same folder in as the whole module. So it's this view, view folder. What is also changed is that for registering our module, we now have two different files, unlike the, the one that we had in Magento 1. So now we have registration.php file, which is very simple. Um, you just need to replace um, on line five, you put your vendor name and module name, and that's pretty much it. This file sits under the root of your extension. And you also have another file for registering your module, and that is called modules.xml. So again, a little bit more boilerplate code. You can see that if your extension needs to depend on some, some other system module, you can define that dependency under these sequence tags. So like I did here, for example, this extension depends on Magento widget. And this is, this is new concept in Magento 2, um, Composer. So if your extension depends on some third party library that doesn't ship with Magento, in that case, you're advised to use Composer. 
So if you're not familiar with Composer, basically it's a package manager for PHP. Um, it's, it's extremely popular these days in the community because all PHP projects are using it, and I think that's why it's so good addition to, to Magento 2 framework. So if you need um, third-party PHP extension, you just create a Composer JSON file in the root of your extension, you define that dependency inside the require section, and with a simple command, it's going to be pulled in for you. So that's really cool. XML configuration. What has changed in XML configuration? Okay, so beside modules XML file that we saw for registering the our extension, there are a bunch of other files, smaller XML files that you can use depending on your needs. So we still have config XML file, but it's much smaller now in Magento 2 because it is used only for storing default system configuration. And we have, for example, events XML, route XML, and there are a bunch of them. They're more meaningful. di.xml is the one that is important because it's new, and it is used to configure the dependency injection and the object manager. We will talk about it in later slides. One very, very important change about um, XML files, it's, it's important for us developers because it's developer friendly, is that, well, do you remember, for example, if when you, when you worked on extension and it didn't work for some reason, and you were spending like a couple of hours trying to figure out what typo you made in your, in your XML files? Well, that cannot happen in Magento 2 anymore because of this. So every single XML file is now validated against a particular schema. So for example, widget XML file, you see how it looks in Magento 1, and on the bottom is how it looks on Magento 2. So th this basically means that widgets XML needs to follow strictly rules defined in widget XSD. XSD stands for XML schema definition. So if you, for example, try to add some node that is not supported in this schema, PHP will throw an exception. And that's really helpful because it will let you know exactly what, went, what went, went wrong. But, for example, I was working on an extension which uses widgets and we needed to have a field for uploading images. But that's not possible because by default in this schema, um, it is defined that you can only use text, select, and multi-select fields in your widgets. So in this case, what you do, you define your own schema definition document, and you basically need to instruct Magento that widget XML in your extension needs to be validated against that schema and not the default one. If you run in these kind of problems, I wrote a blog post on mageclass.com, so feel free to check it out. And now my favorite part, some of the most important PHP changes for Magento 2 developers. So what we have? We have namespaces instead of long class names. We have dependency injection instead of mage class. New conventions for changing the core, and we will finish this presentation by saying that controllers have been broken down by actions. So let's review one by one. Namespaces instead of long class names. So this may be a new concept for you if you haven't been working with anything else beside Magento, but namespaces are essentially a way for encapsulating classes. So a category class can exist in multiple locations in our file system. So in Magento 1, we used a long class names to be very specific about particular class. In Magento 2, we use namespaces, so this, this long class name e-commerce masonry block category simply becomes category with, e uh, with the namespace declared at the top. So what, what you will need to do as Magento 2 extension developers, specifically when porting this, is to, to basically replace all long class names with corresponding namespaces. 
the biggest change in Magento 2. So our good old friend Mage class does not exist anymore. So in your Magento 1 code, wherever you see something like Mage colon colon something, it's the clear sign that you need to get rid of it. Why? Because the system doesn't know what Mage stands for. It's completely, you know, dropped out. So the question is, how do we create objects then? And the answer is that we actually don't do it. So in Magento 2, it's considered as a best practice to let the system handle everything for you. It needs to create everything that you need. It's not your responsibility anymore. Instead, you use dependency injection and the object manager, and it's, it, they will handle this task for you. So it's very simple. You have a class. Your class <laughs> has a constructor. And what you do, you list all dependencies or classes that you need in this class constructor, and that's it. The system will sort of peek in here. It's going to figure it out, and it's going to instantiate all of the, stu all, all, all of the stuff. So because this is so, so, so important concept in Magento 2, I'd like to mention this again. So how you, how you create objects? You just request the dependency. You, you, you just request a class in your constructor. You create a protected property. And then you just save uh, instantiated object into that pro protected property so that you can use it later. But I want to give you one very important advice. And that is, you should always try to keep your constructors clean as much as possible. To show you what I mean, this is an example of existing class in the core. To be concrete, this class is catalog model product. And you can see it has a huge list of dependencies which really, really makes it hard to read and to understand. And typically, when you have so many dependencies in your constructor, that basically means that your code smells and is a real, a really clear sign that your class is doing way too much. So when working with dependency injection, always keep that advice in mind. You need to keep your construct constructors clean as much as possible. Now, we are not still done with dependency injection. When working with Magento 2, you will typically see three types of classes that are requested in constructors. The first one are stateless classes, which we refer to as injectables. There are entities, which we refer to as non-injectables. And there are interfaces. So what are injectables? Injectable is actually a class that can be passed directly to the constructor. Helpers, helper classes in Magento, are a good example of in injectable classes. So this is just comparison. On the left, we can see how we instantiated helpers in Magento 1. And on the right, we see how we do it in Magento 2. So in this case, with injectables, you're basically allowed to provide the full path to the class, and the system will instantiate it, because it's going to understand. It's, it's going to be able to instantiate that object. But this is not the case, for example, with non-injectables. Non-injectables non are apparently classes that cannot be passed through the constructor. Models that represent records from the database, resource models, collection, these are all types of classes, good examples of non-injectables. So again, a comparison. On the left, this is how we instantiate product object in Magento 1. And on the right is a non-working example of how would we do it in Magento 2. It's not working because if we follow the same pattern as we did for, for helpers, it's not going to work. The system will not be able to instantiate this class. So how do we do this? There is a new concept called factory. So factories 
are basically classes that have the same name as classes they instantiate suffix with factory keyword. So rather than requesting Magento Catalog Model Product, we are going to request Magento Catalog Model Product Factory. And this one will be able to create your model object. So it, can, it has access to create method, which basically creates the instance. So I just wanted to make it, it very clear and obvious for you and to make a distinction between how you request injectables versus non-injectables. And the third type of class that you will typically find in your constructors are interfaces. In Magento, in its core, you will find a lot of interfaces requested because um, they recommend doing, doing it in this way. Um, because in this case, um, your class doesn't depend uh, on a concrete class, but it depends on um, some kind of contract. So when you have something like this, the system will basically go into di.xml file and it will search for all preference tags. And what it, it's going to find? Well, this is a match, obviously. So it basically instructs the system to, whenever it sees something like Magento Framework Cap Config Scope, Scope Config Interface, it should actually instantiate this class at the bottom. So that's how it's basically working. Preferences can be also used for class rewrites in Magento 2, which leads us to the next big topic for today, and this is new conventions for changing the core. So as we just said, we still have, pre we still have preferences, we have observers, and there is a new concept called plugins. So let's quickly see each of them. Preferences is, are something that, uh, that is most similar to class rewrites in Magento 1. So to give an example, on the left, this is how we do it in Magento 1 again, and on the right, this is how we do it in Magento 2. So basically, we are using config XML in Magento 1, and we, and we define rewrites nodes to provide, to provide our rewrite. But in Magento 2, we are using di.xml, as we said, and we are using these preference tags. So that's pretty much it. The rest is simple. PHP code is, is the same, basically. But again, one advice, please keep, keep in mind that preferences should be your last option when you need to rewrite something. So if you need to rewrite a, a core method, you should always try to use some other approach, and if it's really not possible, then preferences are okay option. Observers. Observers still exist in the system in Magento 2, still very good to use, and basically they're implemented in the same way, in the, in the similar way as in Magento 1. The difference is that in Magento 1, we used, again, config XML file to declare our observer, but now in Magento 2, we use events.xml file to do basically the same thing. What is also different is that in Magento 2, there is no, there is no reason for, for, um, for giving a name to, to your method in your observer that will handle, wh which will react to, to the event, because the system gives it out of the box. Um, y when, you, when you declare observers in your Magento 2, you, you define observer class, and you need to have execute method. This method will be basically called by default, it accepts observer object, and then this is where you do your stuff. Plugins. So this is one of my favorite parts about Magento 2. However, there is one downside, and that is that plugins are working only with public methods. So if, if you need, for example, to rewrite protected or private method in Magento 2, plugins are not the options. You need to either use observers or use preferences. Unfortunately, we are very limited in time today, so I cannot cover them fully as I wanted, but I have created a screencast on Mage class. So if you're interested, if you like to learn from screencasts, feel free to check it out. 
essentially, I just wanted to give you the essential, essentially how plugins are working. Let's say that you have a um, method get name in your in your code, and this is public method, of course. And the way you you define your plugins is basically you have a plugin class, and you can declare methods in the same way as you would do it in the plain English. So you have you can declare before get name, which will be basically executed before the original method is called. There is also after get name, which will be executed after the original method is called, and the route around get name, this round hook is used for replacement because it's executing in the same time as the original method, so this is used to basically replace the whole the, the whole function. And we will finish this talk by saying something about controllers that have been broken down in uh, by action. So what I mean by that? Well, in Magento 1, we used to have, we could have actually, pretty large controllers, which, which could have a lot of different actions, like index action, save action, edit action, and so on. But in Magento 2, all of these actions go into the separate controller. So for example, save action from one controller will become a dedicated class, save.php file, and all of these controllers need to have a method called execute. This is something similar to the observers. So this is the main function in all of your controllers, which will perform some logic and then return a response. So in a conclusion, I think that Magento 2 is a big step forward because it forces us to upgrade our coding skills. So don't be scared to make a switch. Think about it as a level up for your professional career. When you start working on porting extensions, I highly recommend for checking code migration tool as a great starting point. Also, keep this in mind, never ever use object manager directly. You need to work with the dependency injection framework, but also keep in mind that your constructors should stay as clean as possible. And finally, one of the last advices that I can give you is to try to make interface-driven design. So rather than requesting concrete implementations, try to use interfaces. Thank you very much. <laughs>